Hey out there, welcome to this week's Cribble Weekly Demo, pulling data from Prometheus targets. Um, before we jump in, just wanted to take the time to introduce myself to those of you that I haven't met. I'm Desi gavis Houston, and I'm the Senior Solutions Marketing Manager here at Cribble. Previously, I led the national sales development team at a co-working company called Industrious. And then before that, I was on the sales team at an ad sales enablement company called Media Radar. Um, I also built the sales development team at Trello. So my path to Cribble is a little non-traditional for sure, and I've been in a few different industries in my career. Um, ultimately, though, it was a no-brainer for me to come to Cribble because um, I really enjoy matching people and teams with tools that give them more flexibility and choice in their business. And ultimately, that's what our flagship product, Cribble Logstream, provides. So great to meet you. Here's what to expect on today's call. Let's get into it. So almost every week, we'll be doing a demo of Cribble Logstream and walking through specific use cases in the product. First, I'll do a quick introduction to observability pipelines and Logstream for those of you who may not be as familiar with us or what we do. And then from there, we'll move into a full demo of Logstream. We'll talk through um, the specific use case for that week at that point. Obviously, this week, that's going to be pulling data from Prometheus as a source then you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions of me regarding Cribble, Logstream, or anything you've heard or seen today. Global data is growing at a 25% compounded annual growth rate. I feel like everyone understands this to a degree, right? So if we take being in a global pandemic, for example, rather than our business meetings happening in person, they're happening on Zoom. And Zoom's generating data, right? So even if you think about it from a non-technical perspective, it's easy to see that data is growing astronomically. Uh, by 2025, enterprises are gonna be managing 250% more data than they were in 2020. So the amount is growing, but there's another problem. Logging systems are already at capacity. Um, I hear from enterprises daily with costs in the millions when it comes to licensing uh, and the infrastructure required to store this growing set of data can cost as much or more than commercial licensing costs. More data, also means you need more CPU dedicated to analyzing it. Uh, for many of our customers, the added infrastructure costs can be in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and then on top of all of that, right, you get inadequate data retention in some organizations. When your logging system is reaching its limits, many people believe they have no choice when it comes to dropping data that they'd like to keep around. To get the answers that you need out of your environment, you need to onboard new sources of data. Most companies drop large portions of high volume sources just because it's too cumbersome and costly to analyze everything. Uh, you may also have retention policies in place to meet certain standards and regulations, but you're having to kind of guess, you know, how long can I afford to keep this wider set of data around? You may even need to revisit that data later, especially if you're investigating a security breach or trying to understand any long-term trends in your IT environment. And then for some use cases, they may need to keep data on hand for years. Uh, that data needs to be ready for analysis the entire time. Last thing here, systems are optimized to handle data analysis and retention separately. So what that means is you often end up using many different tools to retain and analyze all of your machine data. And adding each one of those tools also adds complexity and hidden costs. So like I mentioned before, environments are getting super complex. You have your object storage, your time series databases, your data lake houses, and each of those are going to have their own agents and their own ingestion pipelines. It gets really tough to manage it all, and it forces enterprises to make some hard choices about which data they're going to send to where. And with those choices come trade-offs. Uh, you end up playing kind of this three-way tug of war, right, with cost flexibility and visibility. I mean, the more data you analyze and the longer you retain it, the more it costs you. Standardizing on a single tool obviously is gonna limit flexibility uh, and dropping data to keep the cost down, that's gonna limit uh, what you can learn or even investigate over time. So how do you do it? How do you manage the trade-offs of analyzing everything you need to get insights from your machine data formatted for all the tools you use without busting your budget? Well, an observability pipeline solves all of these problems. And our product, Cribble Logstream, helps teams implement an observability pipeline without replacing any existing tooling. Cribble Logstream enables customers to choose what data they want to keep, in what format, and in which data store, all while providing the assurance that they can also choose to delay any 
or all of those decisions with a full fidelity copy and low cost storage. Logstream also provides customers with a vendor agnostic solution to route data to and from any tooling source or destination. So regardless of which tools are in use, right, Logstream can centralize the forwarding of all that machine data, get it to the right destination and ensure it's shaped, enriched with whatever information you need and ready for analysis or simply on standby for when it might be needed in the future. And then lastly, Cribble Logstream significantly decreases an organization's logging and monitoring costs, saving customers about 30% of infrastructure costs on average. So one question that might be popping up for you is, Desi, doesn't data streaming already exist? Yes, and the data streaming solutions that do exist are not purpose-built for polystructured data. On the other hand, an observability pipeline, which is what Cribble Logstream helps put in place, is purpose-built to work with even the most complicated data formats. So the data you need probably exists in multiple sources, with different protocols that dictate how that data is generated and collected, right? So you've likely got data coming in in a variety of formats, and those formats may not always match the formats required by the tools that you use. Uh, you probably also come across streaming solutions that just couldn't scale with your business requirements, right? Cribble Log Stream can. We've tested it at over 20 petabytes of data a day. So if you remember nothing else I've said today, remember this, Cribble helps implement an observability pipeline to route security and machine data where it has the most value. We help slash costs, improve performance, and get the right data where it's needed in the formats required. With Cribble Logstream, you can reshape, reduce, or route data so that you remain compliant and get the insights you need in the most cost-effective way possible. So next, I want you to see the product. My colleague, David Maislin from our solutions engineering team has graciously recorded a full walkthrough of some of the key use cases of Logstream. Let's take a look at that now. Hello, I'm David Maislin. I work for Cribble. I'm a principal solutions engineer. And today we're gonna to be giving you a brief talk of our product features discuss the distributed deployment architecture and cover some basic concepts and show a live demo of Cribble Logstream. So first off, what is Cribble Logstream? Well, when you have logs, metrics, and traces, and you're trying to get the data from your sources to the intended destinations, it can be quite challenging. Logs can be pretty messy, ugly, noisy, and sometimes you just want to see the signal and not all that noise. And not only that, all those events, all that extra traffic can cost a considerable amount when we're talking about your storage or your license. So Cribble Logstream will allow you to implement an observability pipeline and help you to parse, restructure, and enrich the data in flight before it lands in the data analytics store which will get the right data where you want it in the formats that you need it. So first off, when we talk about routing data, sometimes data doesn't always land in one place. Uh, you want it to land in many places. For example, uh, some of your data could land in Splunk, other data might land in Elastic, but all of your data, just to keep it for future reference uh, security investigations might need to land in S3. So we allow you to route your data to the best tool for the job or all the tools. We allow you to translate it, reformat, enrich it into any schema that you require because different departments have different needs for analytics. So you can put the data where it has the most value. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, data can be quite large, noisy. Uh, there's a lot of times when people leave things like debug on uh, without thinking about the impact that it might have on the end data analytics store. So as much as 50% of that log and metrics data goes unused. Uh, there's null fields, duplicate data, fields with just no value at all. And with Logstream, you can trim that wasted data stream and analyze only what you need. 
We also allow you to collect data from multiple sources in pretty much any format using the tools that you already are using today. Splunk forwarders, uh, Winbeats, uh, Elastic, various plugins, Syslog, whatever it might be. We allow you to reach out and collect the data using REST, Firehose, uh, HTTP, TCP, and pull that data from Microsoft Office 365, for example. And once we pull that data in and it lands in the intended destinations, one of them might be something like S3. If you ever needed to replay that data, pull the data back in at any time, you can simply select a few buttons, pull that data back in, and do ad hoc data collection uh, for later investigations. And lastly, you want to shape your data. You really want the ability to process machine data before you pay to analyze it so that you can transform it, you can enrich it with lookups, GOIP information, or other specific information related to your specific company business. Uh, you can parse the data, restructure the data, so that you can focus on that signal and not the noise. Let's talk about the architecture for a distributed deployment of Cribble Logstream. As I mentioned earlier, we support all the sources that you can probably think of. Uh, we're going to be able to collect data using Splunk Universal Forwarders and Heavy Forwarders, uh, Elastic Beats agents that have integrated load balancing. Uh, you can send data via Syslog, uh, FluentD, HTTPS, uh, TCP, TCP JSON. And finally, the pull sources uh, using an API will go collect the data from the required sources like Kafka, Amazon S3, Kinesis, SQS, or Azure Event Hubs. When that data flows into Cribble Logstream, we place Logstream worker groups, uh, a collection of worker nodes that sits closest to the egress point to save money. The idea is that if you can reduce all the noise, trim the data, drop events that simply don't matter at the source, like in the cloud, and maybe you're sending the data to another cloud provider or internally to your on-premise deployment, then it's going to save you a ton of money on your bandwidth. It's going to reduce the amount of traffic flowing into your solution like Splunk. It's going to free up additional license cost. Uh, increased search performance. All of that is controlled through the user interface in the master node that's integrated with Git and your repos for version control, which we'll cover during the demo. Once the data is processed using log stream routes and pipelines, it's going to land or go to the destinations of your choosing. So some of the data will go into Splunk. Other data might go into Elastic. Some data might need to go to S3 directly and never land in either store or all of the above. The flexibility is tremendous. Let's talk about a demo. So first and foremost, when you land in Cribble Logstream, you have the ability to monitor the events in and out the bytes in and out from your various sources. As you see here, and you can see the status of the sources that were healthy, we're collecting the data, and the destinations. In this case, we can see that one of the destinations is having some challenges. Cribble Logstream in the worker nodes can do persistent queuing and other behaviors such as rejecting events or dropping events depending upon the intended or required behavior that you choose. In this case, we could set it up such that any data that can't get to the destination can simply queue up in a persistent queue across the Logstream worker nodes until the destination is back up. Maybe you're doing a maintenance on the 
Splunk infrastructure on the indexers. Maybe it was a network issue. Maybe it was a restart of the indexers, uh, something like that. Uh, you won't worry about losing any of your data. If there's any challenges, all of the data will be retained with full fidelity. And again, you could also send it to multiple destinations, such as S3. Let's review some sources inside of a worker group. And again, a worker group in this case, we're going to call it logs. This could be AWS, this could be Azure, this could be uh, on-premise, whatever you decide to call your worker group. We're going to go into this worker group. Now, the first thing you see is you are in the routes. And before we discuss what the routes are, let's talk about the sources. So here you see various sources that you can configure to receive data. Uh, so if, for example, we wanted to receive data from syslog, you select syslog and you can add your various IPs, we'll receive data on any port over UDP or TCP. We support TLS, syslog over TLS out of the box. Another source could be Splunk, whether that's the HTTP event collector or Splunk TCP. We act just like a heavy forwarding tier or an indexer in that we will receive the data. We're not going to store the data for analytics, but we're going to process the data just like Splunk. So you simply add a new source, configure the IP, the port, and you can even whitelist various IPs, uh, configure the line breaking, event breaking, add additional fields, and do any additional pre-processing before the data enters the routes and the pipelines. Let's take a look at the routes. So what you see here on the left, from the top to the bottom, is as data comes in, we're going to match data against a specific filter. This might look somewhat familiar to you. This is JavaScript expressions, uh, which is a very universal language. Uh, so that we basically have said, if data comes in for Palo Alto network traffic, then process it with a pipeline. A pipeline is a set of functions that is applied to a route. Finally, output the data to one or more destinations of your choosing. And at the bottom, you see final. Final means you're done with this data, this specific type of data. Do not go to any of the routes below that you see here. The next route we see is the archival route. It says true, so all data that hits this specific route is going to pass through. No filtering, no functions are being applied, and land directly in S3. This isn't final, so this means that data will continue down the routes for additional processing to land in additional destinations. If at any time you make a decision, because in this scenario, we said that the Palo Alto traffic is final, it's never going to land in S3, and you wanted to make sure that all data landed within S3, you can just drag the route and change the order of processing. And now what we are saying is all data that passes in through these routes is going to go and land in S3, including the Palo Alto data. Once you make a change, you just simply save the change. And as you see here, you can commit the change because we're integrated with Git and your local repos as well. And I'll just say changed the order of the routes to include pan data. Once I commit that change, I can deploy those changes. And once I do that, the workers are going to be checking in every 10 seconds. And in this case, the logs worker group 
is going to check into the master, notice that there's been a change to the routes, pull down the changes, then they're going to process the data according to those changes. Once the data is done being processed, it's going to now land in S3. When it receives the change, the config version here will then turn green. That happens about, I don't know, somewhere between every 10 to 30 seconds, just like you see right here. It is now green. Let's go back to those routes again. And now we're going to take a look at some of the various pipelines that we've applied to this data. In this case, we're going to look at trim big JSON data. This is the filter that it's going to match on. We're going to enter the pipeline from the route. And here we see we are now in pipelines. We have a comment. Comments allow you to document everything that's happening within a route or a pipeline. And in this case, we're going to capture some data right now live from the various workers in the log worker group. When we capture data, you can see that the filter expression carried over when we enter the pipeline from the route. And it's going to allow me to capture the data from the various worker nodes, adjusting the time frame that I capture, as well as adjusting how many events I want to capture and where I capture those events. As they enter the system at step one before processing, as they enter the various routes and processing pipelines, and as they exit for various post-processing, and finally, as you see here, on the way to the destination. So let's just capture the data before it gets processed. We'll hit start. Now we see the events are flowing in, and they're captured into a sandbox. This is a a temporary uh, staging place where you can create new pipelines uh, with various functions and test out the behaviors before you deploy it to the various worker groups. If I don't do anything and I just stop my capture now, it's going to expire this captured sample after whatever time frame you set. If I were to rename this, something like that, now this will no longer expire until I choose to delete it. It's helpful for keeping a template of the various events that you're processing through Kribble Logstream. Let's save this as a sample file. Once I hit save, we now see here on the right that we have data. These are very large JSON events. We can recognize the format of structured data so that if I select expand, I can now see the JSON object. And the one thing to note is what we talked about in the comment earlier is we need to remove multi-header and null fields from the raw event. And we're going to apply a function called parser to the data. If we look at the data on the right, as it comes in, we see body, we see headers with 20 items, and headers has the various accept and cloud front and other bits of data, but there's also a redundant field here called multi-value headers, which has the same values that you saw in the headers field up above. We also notice that there's some null data here. Why would you want to pay for data that has no value. Let's look at the parser function. We're basically saying for the source type of Lambda, this function is going to be processing the event. We are going to remove the multi-value headers and the null fields and rewrite raw using a reserialize operation. We could just as easily extract fields as the extracted fields like you would see within a data model uh, inside Splunk by changing the operation mode. And in this case, since I know the data is JSON and I'm applying this function to the source field of raw, 
here's what I'm going to do. Remove multi-value header field. And this fields filter expression basically says only keep events that are not null. Value is not equal to null using the expression here, the JavaScript expression, uh, which matches on the value and the type as well, ASCII or numeric. Let's take a look at what would happen if I send the data on to the intended destination. Well, first, when I expand the object, you'll notice that multi-value headers is gone. Null values have also been removed, but yet the event has been re-serialized in the proper structure, something that would be pretty much impossible to do using things like sed command or regex to manipulate the structured event. If I wanted to remove additional fields like request context, just type it directly into the fields to remove. Hit enter and hit save. Now again, this is not being applied to the worker groups until I commit and deploy the changes. And if I made a mistake, I can roll back to prior, prior releases of the changes uh, with the click of a button. Once I added this new field, let's take a look at the savings. So now, almost 65% of the event size is gone. It's been reduced, but we've not lost any of the value of the data. The full fidelity still exists not only because we've removed redundant fields and no value fields like null, but also because all of the data is also landing in S3 in case you perhaps needed to see the original event before you reduce the event. If in the future, once you deploy this change to your event, your manager says, you know what, we actually need this field, so please uh, add it back into the data, you select it, remove it, hit save, and what you'll notice is now request context is now included in the event sending on to your destination like Splunk. If I take a look at the changes now, it still shows that we're removing about 45% of the event, a tremendous reduction in license. Uh, because you've also removed redundant data and null value fields, it means less data is going to land on your indexing tier, and that means your searches are going to be much faster. Further, because all of the data is landing in S3, you don't have to retain the data for as long, because it's not very often that you're asked to run a search from three months ago and display the results. We're looking at the here and the now. Other reasons are because the data is in S3 untouched, you might want to replay the data in the future. So sometimes organizations have set up clustering and replication, which can take your data that's been indexed and make two to three copies of that data across your indexing tier. That can cause additional performance issues. Well, now that you have the data in multiple places and can replay the data at any time, you could make a dis decision to reduce the amount of retention, saving infrastructure costs and storage costs because you have less data in the environment because you're no longer needing to cluster or replicate the data. That's going to increase your overall performance. And finally, the reduced events, that's going to save your organization a tremendous amount of license that now has been opened up for other data use cases, which would allow you to pull in additional data. So that's a review of a single function in Cribble Logstream. We see trim big JSON. Let's review something a little more complex and more powerful. We'll take a look at Palo Alto firewall traffic. So I've entered the Palo Alto traffic from the route 
and I'm in the GOIP enrich pipeline that we see right here. This pipeline is a collection of many functions that exist within Logstream. These functions include things like the ability to aggregate data as metrics, uh, perhaps, again, adding comments, dropping data, sampling and dynamic sampling, compression, keep one out of every 100 events that are from trusted zones, for example, regular expression extraction. I'm sure many of you are used to that. Uh, updating your props and your transforms uh, can be difficult, and sometimes you can make mistakes. We allow you to parse data out of the box, and all of this is done through the user interface. There's no need anymore to update things within config files and have to deploy them out to the indexing tier uh, and wait for indexer rolling restarts, for example. Let's review this pipeline. So again, we're commenting. What I'm saying when I enter this pipeline is if somebody accidentally said, send the data to this pipeline and it's not matching the source type of pan traffic, you're final, you're done. Don't process that data, leave this route because we're not going to accept that data that doesn't have that source type. The next function is parser. And as you see here, it says on all data that was allowed to enter this pipeline, its filter is true. So all data that comes into this pipeline, I'm going to extract all the events from that all, <laughs> all of the field names from that event. Let's take a look. Here is data as it comes in. It's in the syslog protocol. We can see that here because of the facility and the log level exists right here. Uh, we can expand that. We see the common delimited event. This is what the data looks like as it leaves this pipeline. All of the fields have been extracted as well as enriched, which we'll cover in a moment. Uh, this is, in a sense, a pre-built data model. These extracted fields will land in Splunk, and you will be able to search for them uh, using tstats. It's basically building your data model before you have to do it inside of Splunk, which can affect the performance of your indexing tier. You no longer have to run data model acceleration every five to 15 minutes. And again, it's a tremendous improvement in the performance in your environment. The fields here that you see within this parser function, I just simply copy these and pasted them from Palo Alto's documentation on what represents a Palo Alto traffic event. If at any time you didn't want to pull specific fields, you can remove them. You can decide which fields to keep, which overrides which fields are removed. And again, like you saw earlier, you could decide to not index any null value or events that just simply don't matter, like placeholder events, for example, future use. Let's minimize this. And one of the things that you'll notice is I created a group so that way I can easily understand what is happening within my pipeline. The first group is extraction and reduction and I have other groups below here. In the extraction and reduction I also have a drop function where if a log subtype equals start the event will just simply get dropped. It could be if you have debug logs coming and you choose to drop them because you don't want to fill up your indexing tier with debug at, at any given time because nobody told you that they were going to turn it on and perhaps they accidentally left on debug and it's going to uh, have a dramatic impact on your indexing tier. Other things that you could choose to do would be like sampling. If I'm getting bytes in is equal to zero, maybe keep one out of every five events. That's what we see here. If I'm getting data in from the firewall from trusted zones, internal networks, uh, maybe keep only one out of every 10 events. 
which would again be about a 90% reduction of your traffic that normally gets indexed but never searched. Nobody looks for it. And this is on or off. I could turn this on with the simple toggle of the switch right here. Let's move into enrichment. In this case, uh, we've again commented, we're gonna do GOIP lookups against MaxMind for the source IP and the dest IP. And we are gonna output a result field, source underscore GOIP and dest underscore GOIP. And we see that right over here on the right. We see the city, the continent, the country, the locations, the postal code, subdivisions, and things like that. That was done on an event by event basis, pulling in the data, enriching it at search time because IP blocks change. And in six months from now, in a product like Splunk, if you were to do a search lookup against an external IP, the location according to MaxMind could change. And so it might be best for you to add the enriched information at index time for the purposes of a security investigation. Maybe a year from now, you needed to replay that data from S3, having the comfort knowing that this information was enriched before it went to S3 and landed with that data means that your security team will have accurate information when they recover that data. We of course support other things like lookup tables, uh, reverse DNS, where it'll take an IP and match it to the DNS host names, as well as maybe internal CIDR notation, where I'm saying if the IP address comes in and it's internal, do a lookup against this lookup table and return the CIDR output. Other things that we do would be to look at compromised tables. This is a value expression which says, look up the IP address information, and let's do a pop out here. Look up the IP address information against the source IP or the destination IP and simply match on that. And if it's true, then return the result or false, as you see here, all done within our UI. Additional routes and pipelines might be used for the purpose of sensitive data. And in this case, masking data, like from a business event we see right here. So for business events, uh, maybe you're looking at this data sample right here, and you say, what is the effect of this function to look for social security numbers, credit cards with LUN algorithms, things like that? We have built-in expression matching that you see right here. We said, go look for a social security number pattern and mask it using an MD5 hash. This is what it looks like as the event comes in, and this is the masked event as the event leaves the system to the intended destination. We do the same for regular expression. If you're working within the solution and maybe you need to do a regular expression extraction on the fly without having to go to external sites where you might copy sensitive data and paste it to a site where you're not supposed to do that, you can create your expressions directly inside Logstream and create the match right here inside our user interface. When you're done with the capture that you might need to use as a field name, you simply save it and then what you will have after you save it is a new field name right there. That's the power of Cribble Logstream. Now I've shown a lot of various capabilities of Logstream, how data comes into routes, how data uh, is processed within a pipeline. And as I've talked about how data might land in multiple destinations, including S3. And as we know, we don't retain data in the 
data analytics store for very long because the storage can be enormous and expensive. So by reducing retention, maybe from 12 months to 30 days, because that's typically what a lot of organizations might do when they use Logstream, the infrastructure cost is going to go down dramatically. But Logstream, if you ever had your security team call you and say, hey, we need to recover data from all the data that happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, inside of Cribble Logstream, first off, I'm going to replay the data using a collector from AWS S3 storage. It could be MinIO back storage, uh, where the data is sitting locally in your environment. I can preview the data before I re-index the data and pull it back into the system. I select the date if I wanted to maybe go back a week. I can change the filter because maybe you included tokens when you wrote the data out to the destination, like the source IP, the desk IP, the username, the department, the source type, the host. You can update your filter to match any specific recovery match that you would need to pull back in without having to pull back in all of the buckets that traditionally you might have to run a script on a single host. When we do the recovery using Cribble Logstream, all of the worker nodes are tasked to do the recovery where it load balances the recovery of the data. Here I'm choosing to preview the data before I pull it in against an absolute time range. For the next 60 seconds, I'm gonna look for 100 events. And this is a live capture directly from AWS. This is not a demo. And we see the events. Just like you saw earlier when I captured events into the sandbox, I can save this as a sample file. And once I've saved that sample, I can close out this sample, go back to my pipelines, review that sample right here, create additional routes and pipelines against this sample, uh, and recover the data to perhaps a different destination. Maybe I want to recover the data to a third party provider. Uh, maybe I moved to a managed service provider and I want to transfer all data to them. Maybe I want to recover this data that used to exist within Splunk, and now I want to recover it into Elastic. All of the things are possible because you have the ability to, again, collect from any number of sources and land the data into any intended destination through the routes and the pipeline pairs. And that is the demo of Cribble Logstream. I hope you found value in today's presentation. Thank you. All right, so you just saw, if I can get to my next slide here, there we go. You just saw a few general cases of Cribble Logstream. Hopefully that's got some gears turning for you around how Logstream can help you optimize your data. Let's get a little more specific. So for the past few weeks on these demos, I have been focusing on new features we've added with our latest version, Logstream 2.4. Uh, one of the things that we've added is support for Prometheus as a source. Now, one thing to note is that Prometheus is a pull source, uh, meaning Logstream actually fetches data from Prometheus as opposed to a push source like Splunk TCP um, that's going to send that data to Logstream. Uh, we support a ton of other pull sources as well, like Kafka, Kinesis, um, Azure Event Hubs, Office 365, S3. There's some more. Um, so next we'll walk through how to pull data from Prometheus targets. Here's a video, this time from my colleague, Matthew Pike, to show you how that is done. Hello, this is Matthew Pike, a solutions engineer here at Cribble. We're always listening to our valued customers about which features are most important to them. When a feature is requested, we start tracking those requests, and when we see something gaining momentum, we start investing in those features. Uh, one such feature is using Prometheus as a source. It, it really couldn't be easier to set this up. Let's take a quick look. Go into our worker groups, uh, choose the worker group we want to set the source up in, data and sources, and you can see here we've got Prometheus. 
and we'll look at this one that's previously configured. So at a minimum, uh, we need to provide an input ID, as we always do for a new source or destination, and a list of targets uh, that we want to scrape. Uh, everything else is default here. Uh, one thing you might want to do is adjust the poll interval. This is how many minutes between polls of uh, pulling down the next batch of, of metrics. Like you might want to dial this down to one minute or maybe even make it longer if you have a, a data source that you know is not very chatty. Uh, one interesting side note here is these targets that we're going to be scraping are actually from a previous uh, weekly web demo that we did. And I will pull that up real quick. It's from where we did the logs to metrics uh, and we did some aggregation, uh, but also the very last function we had was Prometheus Publisher. So this data that's flowing through this pipeline gets published to this Prometheus Publisher endpoint. And then the Prometheus source that we just set up is actually pulling from those publishers. And it allows us to take that data and send it somewhere else. Obviously, you might not be eating your own dog food like this, but I thought it was a neat way to show the flexibility of, of Logstream. That's really it. It's very simple, very easy to set, set up, and, and very straightforward. I appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you very much. All righty. Um, now, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have about Cribble, um, about Logstream, or configuring Logstream to receive data from Prometheus. Uh, we do have one pre-submitted question, so I'll go ahead and answer that now. Um, in the meantime, if you do have any questions that came up for you during this hour, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit those at this time. So the question that we got was, um, you mentioned some of the sources uh, you support, I guess this is from our last week's demo, which destinations does Logstream work with? Great question. Um, so Cribble Logstream can send data to various destinations, um, including Splunk, Kafka, Kinesis, um, InfluxDB, Snowflake, Databricks, TCP JSON, many others. Um, and depending on the source or your requirements, you can get that data in real time or in batches. So there's more on this in our documentation, along with some super helpful architecture diagrams. So you can see the relationship between the sources, Cribble Logstream, and the des destinations. So I highly recommend checking that out. Um, you can find it at docs.cribble.io. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so that is that. Uh, after I get the recording back from this call, I will share that with you guys via email. Uh, next week, we'll walk through how to replace your syslog server with Logstream. We'll show you exactly how to do that and the volume reduction you can see as a result. Uh, it's something that I'm personally hearing up, hearing come up more and more from our prospects and customers. Um, and we've been seeing folks get at least 30% reduction there. So be on the lookout for this recording from me and I will see you next week. Thanks.